Right guys, how's it going? Welcome back. Today I'm in a Land Rover Discovery Sport HSE. A couple of weeks ago I did a video with a Range Rover Evoque and I had a few comments from people asking me to do a video with a Discovery Sport. And because I don't need much encouragement, I went out and bought this 2017 model. The Discovery Sport's been around since 2015 and it was made to be the replacement for the Freelander 2. And it feels nothing like a Freelander 2. It feels like a much more substantial car, even though it's only about nine inches longer. It feels way more upmarket too. Land Rover are a little bit like Apple with regard to their advertising campaign because they always make the products look so cool. They make it seem like you absolutely can't live without one. Almost as if from the moment you buy one, you'll become more outdoorsy and interesting. Prices for a brand new Discovery Sport start at around 35,000 pounds. But the interesting thing is that used prices have now dropped below 15 grand, making it more affordable for the average family. A late, low mileage, high spec one like this will still set you back 25 grand, but for a luxury SUV, I think that's still very good value. The other good thing about the Discovery Sport is that Land Rover have cleverly offered it with an optional third row of seating, making it a seven seater. It's not as big or spacious as an XC90, so don't expect to get two adults back there, but they are handy to have in case one of your kids invites one of the friends around. In fact, as if to save any embarrassment, Land Rover have called this car a five plus two rather than a seven seater. If you intend to use all seven seats all the time, then you're better off with a large SUV. But for most of the time, this does the job really well. If you compare this to a BMW X3 or an Audi Q5, they're both only five seaters, so it does give the Discovery Sport a clear advantage. Obviously, you've got competitors like the Kia Sorento or the Mitsubishi Outlander, but honestly, the Discovery Sport is worlds apart from those two. One, because of its premium feel, and two, because of its off-road ability. It just has a touch of class that its rivals are lacking. I'm currently sat at 70 miles an hour, there's plenty of power for overtaking from the 2 litre turbo diesel engine. There's not much wind or road noise either. It does feel quite at home at these sort of speeds. Firstly, let's talk about its looks. I think it's a great looking car. It's not too big, it's not too small, it's just well balanced. I mentioned in the Evoque video that the Evoque is a little bit feminine. Now, I'm aware by the way that it's 2020, not 1954, so men and women are free to drive whatever they choose. But whether you like it or not, some cars are just more butch than others, and the Discovery Sport is definitely more masculine than a Range Rover Evoque. I just think that Land Rover have got the styling just right with this. I particularly like the front end, because it looks sporty, but it also looks utilitarian. I like the twin exhaust. I like the rear end styling. They've just done a very good job. And I don't think it'll go out of fashion as quickly as some of its rivals, like the Audi Q3. The Discovery Sport looks at home both in the country and in the city and few cars can pull that off. Engine-wise, they're all four cylinders, either a four-cylinder turbo diesel or a four-cylinder petrol. The model I'm in today is the one that everybody will go for because it sits right in the middle of the range and it's the best all-rounder. This is the two-litre turbo diesel and it's the D180, which gives 180 brake horsepower. They do a D150, which is a little bit gutless, and then they do the D240, which, although it's quicker, does have quite an appetite for diesel. This engine replaced the more agricultural 2.2 litre diesel that was in the Ranger of Revoke that I reviewed a couple of weeks ago. And it's far better, far smoother, far quieter, far more refined. Even this D180 has an auto 60 time of around eight and a half seconds, which for a big, heavy seven seat four wheel drive is quite impressive. It will also average between 38 and 40 miles per gallon. Also, the road tax on this car is only 145 pounds a year. I don't want to sound out of touch now, but I have heard people complain about the fuel economy on the Discovery Sports. And I just can't get my head around that, because how can you complain at getting 40 miles per gallon from a big heavy four-wheel drive? I think it's really impressive. This isn't the quickest thing I've ever driven, but if you put your foot down... It's quite impressive. It pulls like a train. I can't imagine many people wanting to go quicker. I haven't driven the petrol model, so I can't really comment on how they perform. But I know that in a big heavy four-wheel drive, you really want to go for the diesel. Otherwise, you'll spend half your life at the petrol station. It comes as standard with a six-speed manual, or you can opt for the automatic, which is this all-new nine-speed auto box, which is very good. But, as I've mentioned in other videos, a car doesn't need nine ratios. Any more than five or six just gets a little bit annoying. It's great on a motorway run, because in ninth gear, you're doing about 1500 RPM and you're just sipping away at the fuel. But around town, it's quite easily confused. If you put your foot down to overtake something, 
it doesn't know which gear to give you and it always seems to pick the wrong one. It's like going out for a meal with somebody who's very indecisive. Should I have the chicken or the steak? Or should I have the fish? Mm. Just pick something, pick a gear. Give me a gear. It would have just been better with a six speed box in my opinion, but there we are. But don't get me wrong, on a long run it's good because it makes everything quieter, it makes it more efficient. It is a very good car for doing long motorway runs, this. You can fill the tank for about £70 and you'll get about 350 miles before it asks you for any more. So what's it like to drive? Does it deserve to wear the sport badge on the back? Well, the answer is going to surprise you because yes, it does deserve to wear the sport badge. It drives really well. It's fun to drive and quite agile. There's almost no body roll for quite a tall car, which is surprising. Now most SUVs and crossovers are as dull as ditch water to drive, but not the Disco Sport. If you're a petrol head, you'll enjoy driving this car, trust me. I was surprised, it's very good. The steering feels natural and weighted. It doesn't feel artificial like an Outlander or a Sorento. You can, not that most people will, but you can push it into a corner and with it having four wheel drive, you've got all the grip in the world. It really is excellent to drive this. Because it handles very well and it's quite stiff so there's no body roll, you'd expect the ride quality to be compromised, wouldn't you? Well, it isn't. It's way more comfortable than a Range Rover Evoque. The seats are supportive, but they're also quite padded and comfortable. And you don't feel all the bumps in the road like I did in the Evoque. Another positive thing to mention is the visibility is excellent. All the windows are big and wide, which means if you're trying to get a move on on a country road like this, you can see round the corner so you won't smash into a massive Ferguson. Obviously, because it's a Land Rover, it's excellent off-road. It's really very capable, way more than its rivals. Most smaller SUVs aren't good off-road, and that's fine because most people don't care. They don't buy them for that. But Land Rover's clever terrain response system means that it'll never leave you stranded. It's also a very practical car. With the rear two seats folded down, the boot is massive. And you can also fold down the middle row of seats if you're carrying large items. It really would make an excellent family car. There are also lots of cup holders, cubby holes and storage compartments, which I quite like in a car. It's also very safe. It scored top marks on its Euro NCAP safety rating. All the seats are Isofix. This Model 2 has adaptive cruise control, which was a £1,200 optional extra. It's one of those features that you don't think you need until you've had a car with it and then you can't live without it. A bit like the heated steering wheel that it also has. It's a bit of a luxury that, but again, once you've had a car with it, you don't want to lose it. Like the Range Rover Evoque, there are a confusing number of trim levels to choose from. If your budget can stretch, I'd recommend going for the all singing, all dancing HSE model. Because you really do get loads of extras. It's got more tech than the local Dixons. You get a glass roof, heated leather seats, heated steering wheel, sat nav, reverse camera, and the other clever thing is you can also put the camera on even when you're driving along, which is good if you want to keep an eye on your caravan. You get USB points throughout the car, which is really handy. Also, I know I mentioned this in the Evoke video, but make sure you get one with the Meridian sound system because it really is excellent. The sound quality is so sharp and crisp. Again, it's another option that once you've had, you won't want to live without. The interior quality is very good. It's far better than its rivals, but it's not quite as good as you get in the Range Rover Evoque. Some of the plastics feel a little bit cheap and hollow, but it's still got that premium vibe to it. If you've ever driven a Jaguar XE, you'll find a lot of the buttons, switches and dials and gauges quite familiar. All the buttons have a satisfying click. All the dials feel quite precise. It's all very good, basically. Interior space is good too. It's quite light and spacious. I've got plenty of headroom. One little gripe is, this might just be me and my weird driving position, but my left leg sort of knocks against this center console bit here. I suppose I could put it flat down on the, on the footrest, but I sort of tend to drive an automatic like this. And that sort of does knock against that center console there. But again, that might just be me. But no, even with the dark leather interior, it's quite a nice, bright, spacious place to be. Obviously the glass roof helps. It's also a very good tow vehicle. If you fit a tow bar to this, it can tow up to two and a half tons. So if you like to take your holidays in a tin can on a muddy field in Wales, this would do the job because it won't get stuck on the caravan site. By now you're probably thinking, yeah, that all sounds great, Matt, but what about reliability? 
Every time I do a video with a Land Rover, I always get loads of comments from people, usually written in capital letters, telling me that Land Rovers are unreliable pieces of junk and I should have bought a Toyota instead. It get, gets a little bit old after a while. I know nobody wants to buy a car that's unreliable. I'm not a masochist or anything, but I just think if the, if the rest of the car is very good, surely you can put up with the odd little glitch here or there or the odd little niggly thing. I mean, what do you think? Am I right there? Do you put reliability ahead of how it looks, how it drives, how practical it is, how it makes you feel? Is reliability right at the top of your list? Because for me, it's sort of quite far down the list, to be fair. In the quest for a fair and balanced review, I have read loads of different owners' reports for the Discovery Sport before I did this video, and loads of people complain about annoying little squeaks and rattles and glitches and crashes on the, um, the infotainment system. But I could live with that if I really liked the car. Now, as I've driven this today, with the radio off, because with the radio on you can't hear it, but with the radio off, you can hear a few little squeaks and rattles and stuff in the boot. It might just be the parcel shelf that's not secured properly. But that's about it. Also, early Discovery Sports had the last of the old infotainment system. So from 2017 onwards, they got this new system, which is far better. You get the improved dials and gauges and the improved infotainment system. So that really would be a must if I was on the, on the hunt for one of these cars. So as far as I can work out, this is a car that can do it all. It looks great, it drives great, it's good off-road, it's practical, it's spacious. It would be a very good workhorse, this, for the family. It certainly does tick a lot of boxes. So thank you once again for watching. Make sure you give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't done already. If you've got any comments or questions, leave them below, and I'll do my best to get back to you. So cheers, guys. I'll see you next time.